This is NBC News, the flight of Gemini 12, Robert Gorelsky with Wilson Hall and Jay Barbary. And we're about to start reporting the last chapter of the History Gemini series. The astronauts, Buzz Aldrin, James Lovell, are now perched atop their spacecraft, and we're about seven and a half minutes away from the blast-off of the Atlas Agena target vehicle. For a report on what's in this Gemini 12 flight, a report from Wilson Hall. While sweeping 58 times around the globe in their spacecraft, Command Pilot Lovell, he's a veteran, by the way, of last year's 14-day Gemini flight, and Aldrin, Buzz Aldrin, making his first flight, there to exploit the lessons learned on all of the previous two-man Gemini flights. The major goal of this one is to learn if man can work effectively outside an orbiting ship in a pressurized suit. Spacewalkers, as we know, have experienced troubles moving about on the last three Gemini flights, They've raised the question whether astronauts will be able to perform complex tasks slated for later flights. Aldrin plans three excursions outside that would total nearly five hours. He's to take a two-hour spacewalk, conduct two space stands, during which he is to poke his head through an open hatch. And during this uh, walk, he will pace himself very carefully. He will stop to rest often, uh, about two minutes at a time, and using aids such as handrails and foot restraints will help him move about. So that's uh, basically what they're going to do, Bob, on this Gemini 12 mission. Well, we're six and a half minutes away now from the scheduled blast-off of the Atlas with the Agena target vehicle, and the astronauts themselves will be lofted into space in about an hour and 35 minutes from now. I think the best description of this Gemini 12 flight was given by one of the officials of NASA. He said, it's sort of like the last football game of an undefeated season. For conditions at the launch site, let's go down to Jay Barbary. Well, Bob and uh, Wilson, the countdown here on the Atlas Agena target rocket is still moving along without any difficulties, and it's under perfect weather conditions. The sky is a clear autumn blue with hardly any wind across this flat 1,400-acre Florida sand spit. The temperature is in the 70s for the most perfect day yet for a man to space flight. The astronauts, James Lovell and Edwin Buzz Aldrin, are in their Gemini 12 spacecraft here on Pad 19, while final preparations take place for the Atlas Agena launch, which is uh, a little more than a mile south of the Gemini Titan 12 launch pad. If the double launches take place this afternoon, the four-day mission will be underway to close out the Gemini program and make room for the Apollo three-man space project set to get underway early next year. But today's manned flight, uh, number 16 for the country, the uppermost thought in the minds of the launch crew here is another successful launch. They launched six manned Mercury flights from the spaceport without any problems, and nine Gemini spacecraft have soared into orbit with astronauts on board. Now for the latest, we switch to Jack King at Gemini Launch Control. Gemini Launch Control at T-minus 100 minutes and counting, T-minus 5 minutes and counting for the Atlas Agena. The reports are coming rather fast now from block, both block houses on the rapid series of activities taking place. Our astronauts Jim Lovell and Buzz Aldrin checking in with their communications checks and giving readouts of their biomedical uh, sensors. Meantime, at Launch Complex 14, the Agena second stage now has gone on internal power, that is, on its own batteries, and we're starting the last uh, final five minutes of the count. Some of the highlights coming down from here will be the telemetry system of the Atlas going on internal power at three minutes and 30 seconds. We close that liquid oxygen boil-off valve at two minutes and 10 seconds. This will give us our complete load of liquid oxygen aboard the vehicle, some 18,000 gallons. Now coming up on uh, 99 minutes and counting in about two seconds. Mark, 99 minutes and counting, T minus four minutes for the Atlas Agena. As we come up to 98, the time will be five minutes past the hour. We'll attempt to count that down for you. 
We're now three minutes and 47 seconds away. To continue down in the latter stages of the countdown, over about the last minute and a half, the launch vehicle test conductor in the blockhouse... A broad report from Jack King, everything going well. We're about three and a half minutes away now from the launch of the Atlas, 98 minutes away from the scheduled liftoff of the astronauts themselves. When uh, Lovell and Aldrin were suited up at uh, pad 16, they went over to pad 19, they were wearing two signs, one each. One said V and the other said end, this meaning that they were the last men to go up in the Gemini series, the end as they were suited up, with these signs in the backs of their astronaut space suits. That's the story, everything going well at Cape Kennedy, everything looking good on this twice-delayed Gemini 12 mission. You're listening to NBC Radio's coverage of the flight of Gemini 12. This is Robert Goralski with Wilson Hall and Jay Barbary reporting on the flight of Gemini 12. Less than three minutes away now from the scheduled liftoff of the Atlas of Gina, 97 minutes away from the scheduled liftoff of the astronauts. And I think, uh, Jay Barbary, that the astronauts are in excellent mental state despite the fact that they've had these two delays. That's correct, Bob. Uh, we might mention here as we approach this liftoff, every human action possible has been taken. And within just about a little more than two minutes, the target rocket should be triggered to begin the final flight in the Gemini project. The astronauts, again, are inside the Gemini 12 spacecraft, and they will hear a slight rumble when the big Atlas of Gina roars into the sky. And speaking of the sky here today, the weather is perfect. It is the most perfect day that I have witnessed uh, here at Cape Kennedy for a manned launch since the beginning of the Mercury program. It's unbelievable. The temperature is in the 70s. The sky is clear, uh, only a thin layer of clouds above, and uh, the wind. There's practically no wind at all today. It's just the perfect day uh, for the launch, and as always, the thousands of workers here at the spaceport outside of their places of employment here to watch the Atlas Agena target rocket lift off. If uh, the Agena target is successfully orbited, it will become the 1135th object in space above the Earth. Most of these objects are what are called space jump, which uh, were left over from decaying satellites and broken up rocket stages. Of the 1134 objects in space to date, only 261 are working satellites. We're now about a minute and 20 seconds away from the launch of the Atlas Agena rocket. The countdown continues on schedule. We're going to be switching here now momentarily to Jack King at Gemini Launch Control, who, who will give you the final moments of the countdown. Pad 14 has been turned on. It will start pouring out some 30,000 gallons a minute. T-minus one minute and counting. T-minus 60 seconds and counting. All systems still looking good. The sequence still continues to come in. We have an Agena ready light. We have a range safety ready light. The final ready light has just come on at T minus 45 seconds and counting. All systems still looking good. T minus 40 seconds and counting. The crew continues to monitor in the blockhouse. Recorders are now to fast speed. T minus 30 seconds and counting. T minus 30. All our sequent lights appear to be on as we reach T minus 24 seconds and counting. T minus 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds and counting. The sequencer is in. We're on an automatic sequencer at this time. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Pad as a tunnel of water is released beneath the rocket's blast. It's there to cool the steel on the launch pad. The rendezvous target is off its pad. It's on a smooth flight, and you can now hear the roar as it crosses our NBC observation uh, point here. This is not the man to launch. This is the Atlas Agena target rocket. It is preceding the astronauts into orbit by some one hour and 40 minutes. The thunder is literally shaking the spaceport here, as you can hear at this time, as it's headed into the uh, uh, lower regions of the atmosphere, and there's only a slight breeze coming across, bringing the thunder to us at this time. At this moment, it is traveling at 200 miles an hour, and it's uh, slightly a mile high. It's beginning to pitch over for its uh, flight out over the... Uh, 
Atlantic at this time, and the flight is smooth. It's a beautiful one, and we are watching as the fireball grows into a tiny dot into this clear blue sky. Everything is on schedule. The Atlas Agena target rocket off for the final mission in the Gemini program right on schedule. It is now two and a half miles from our observation balcony, and it's six miles high. It's traveling at a speed of 800 miles per hour. During the next eight minutes, the rocket will be generating speed to a velocity of 16,500 miles per hour, the speed required to orbit Earth at an altitude of 185 miles. The Atlas booster, her three engines are burning on schedule. As it continues to climb into the sky, everything perfect. We are beginning to lose sight of it out over the Atlantic Ocean at this moment. But in the Mission Control Center in Houston is NASA spokesman Terry White. He's there where he has maps, charts, and all the necessary equipment to track this flight. We'll pick up his running commentary. We will be getting a report on the flight from Terry White, Mission Control in Houston. Everything on schedule, the Looks Atlas good is for burning. Booster engine cut off. We have just had a report that the two booster engines of the Atlas have cut off on time. That is known as BCO. The sustainer engine, the big center engine, continues to push the Agena target rocket into orbit. BCO, our booster engine cutoff has been confirmed. Now the 47,000-pound thrust sustainer engine will push the, engine, the Agena target vehicle to near insertion speed, whereupon the Agena primary propulsion system will place the Agena into orbit. This Atlas launch vehicle is the same type of launch vehicle that orbited four men and one somewhat apprehensive chimpanzee named Enos during Project Mercury. We're now at two minutes, 50 seconds after Agena liftoff. The rocket is already 60 miles high. Some 105 miles downrange, 56.6 miles altitude. It is now traveling at a speed of more than 7,000 miles per hour, going, going up for this now orbital 50 altitude. Going up of the required velocity for insertion. This is very wide. 43 miles downrange. Seventy miles altitude. Mark, 50%. Required velocity for insertion. One seventy nine miles downrange, seventy seven point nine miles altitude. This is not the man to fly. miles downrange. This is a launch of the Atlas. All Agena incoming data rocket. looks good, according to the flight dynamics officer. Everything's still on schedule. We're getting a report from Terry White at the Mission Control Center in 260 Houston. 260 miles downrange, 96 miles in altitude. Jay, I might point out that Air Force tracking cameras still have the object... Four minutes, inside. 29 seconds after liftoff. Flight Dynamics advises the flight director that we're looking good for sustainer engine cutoff. Coming up here in just seconds, the sustainer engine cutoff where the Atlas booster rocket will separate We've from the Agena target. We've had confirmation of sustainer engine cutoff. Flight Director Glenn Lunny's comment here was that this was a great Atlas. Separation of the Agena from the uh, Atlas has been confirmed. We're now 410 miles downrange, 124.5 miles nautical miles in altitude.
Chris, the next big thing will be to find out if it's actually in orbit. Uh, Jay, what time should we have that? Just a few minutes from now. It takes nine minutes uh, for it to uh, go into orbit. It lifted off at five minutes and 40 seconds ago, so that leaves us uh, three minutes and counting now at uh, 15 seconds. And everything going well. The, this is not the manned vehicle. We 495 miles downrange, 136 miles in altitude. The big critical point of this flight is coming up here in 12 seconds, uh, Robert, when we'll have uh, the, the ignition of the Agena rocket. Initiated. Glenn Primary Lyon. propulsion system should ignite in a few moments. In fact, it should ignite at this very moment. Confirmation of primary propulsion system ignition. Speed looks good. We're now 592 miles downrange and an altitude of 147.8. I might point out these altitude figures he's giving you are We've in. We've also had confirmation that the shroud covering the docking collar on the upper end of the Agena has been separated successfully. Figures Terry find it looks good for insertion into orbit. Miles. This primary propulsion system engine has a thrust of some 16,000 pounds. Seven minutes and ten seconds after launch. some 75 percent of required velocity for insertion at 756 miles downrange 157 nautical miles altitude Better than eight minutes into the flight of the eight target minutes and ten seconds. Nine hundred and ten nautical miles downrange, one hundred and sixty point nine nautical miles altitude. Well, we have about forty seconds to go, Robert, to the end of a successful flight into orbit for the Agena target vehicle for the final flight in the Gemini program. Apparently the Agena is right down the slot on the desired azimuth. The cross-range errors are quite negligible. The uh, intended launch azimuth of the Agena was 83.32 degrees, which is slightly north of east. Coming up on 15 seconds. Coming up on primary propulsion system cutoff. We're now 1,060 miles downrange. The end of the first burn on the rocket should be now. It should be in orbit. We've had primary propulsion system cutoff. Primary propulsion system cut off means the rocket has shut down, has quit burning. And it should have been in orbit, the speed and its path into space. Uh, those were right down the slot, as Terry White announced moments ago from the Mission Control Center. Flight Houston. Dynamics Officer advises Flight Director Lynn Lunny that they've had a good cutoff. Everything looks good. Well, that would seem to indicate We've that had the antenna boom now. extended on the Agena. So the Gemini 12 Agena now, now joins minutes, the others. Six seconds after Agena launch, apparently we've got a perfect bird here in the Agena target. And we're now standing at 
T minus 84 minutes and 47 seconds in the Gemini count. This is Mission Control, Houston. Well, with undramatic um, flair, which characterizes most NASA officials, we got the story that the Agena target vehicle of the Gemini 12 flight is in orbit. It now joins the Agena Gemini 8, 10, and 11. There are quite a few target vehicles up there, but the astronauts, Lovell and Aldrin, will be chasing the Gemini 12 target vehicle. The astronauts themselves are 84 minutes away from blastoff themselves from Pad 19. And Wilson, it was an extraordinarily smooth liftoff, wasn't it? Indeed. There were um, many people of many nations there to see it, too, by the way. There were 20 foreign nations uh, uh, who had sent observers down there. Uh, not Russia, but uh, communist Poland and communist Romania were uh, there today to see it go. We're at Cape Kennedy. Uh, after the two astronauts, Lovell and Aldrin, are uh, blasted off 83 minutes from now. It will still be three minute, three hours and about 45 minutes after they get off before they will catch up with this Atlas or with this Atlas Agena target. Now, just the Agena. The Atlas isn't there anymore. Well, a story again. Uh, it got off exactly on schedule, seven minutes and 59 seconds after the hour. The Atlas uh, soared off the launch pad, pad 14 at Cape Kennedy. And uh, nine and a half minutes later, we got the official word from Houston, the manned spaceflight center, that the Agena target vehicle was at the desired altitude and was in orbit. There have been so many problems with Agenas in the past that I think everyone is concerned uh, at this particular point, or was concerned, we can put it in the past tense now, that it would go well. There had been problems with Agenas in the past. Had anything gone wrong today, had the Agena target vehicle not gone into orbit, we probably would have had to wait until November 23rd for the astronauts themselves to be launched into space on Gemini 12. But uh, the story now is, uh, it's a happy story. A Gina target vehicle, Gemini 12, is in orbit, and 82 minutes from now, the astronauts themselves will be lifted into space. And, Wilson, uh, this is going to be a busy four days for the astronauts. Indeed it is. The um, main thing, of course, that they're all looking for and watching for is the um, the test, the EVA or the walk in space, where they're going to try and see um, how much they can learn. Uh, they have learned a great deal, of course, but the main thing they have learned is that people get very uh, tired indeed up there. So that's going to be their first thing is to find out whether Aldrin, who is the man who is going to walk in space, if his frequent two-minute rest periods will make it easier to do the job uh, than by working steadily at it, which the other men have been trying to do, and whether a chest-packed life support system, which cools the suit, keeps it inflated, uh, plays a large part in making a job harder or easier, as the case may be. So the main thing we'll be watching for is the spacewalk, although, of course, there are rendezvous and docking and many other experiments. We still really haven't had any successful, uh, completely successful spacewalks. The problems have been, uh, been there, and the men just haven't been able to uh, do everything they're supposed to have done. So the problems uh, we hope will be solved this time, that uh, the extended EVA, extravehicular activities, can be completed successfully. This is, of course, the last Gemini uh, shot. After this, we go into Apollo, and many of these problems will be faced in the new program, and it's hoped that uh, this one will be completely successful. As we'll know more about walking in space, and Buzz Aldrin will be doing quite a bit during the next four days. Yes, and we'll know whether or not Buzz Aldrin and uh, Lovell are off uh, 81 minutes from now when uh, they are uh, launched to chase the Agena target vehicle and when they, of course, will start their four-day mission. Well, we're going to break away for a while here. We'll be back in about a quarter of an hour from now to continue reporting on the flight of Gemini 12, and our coverage will be continuous. The astronauts will be lifted off about 80 minutes from now. This is Robert Goralski with Wilson Hall and Jay Barbary reporting from the NBC News Space Center. This is Mission Control Houston at T minus 62 minutes and 57 seconds before Gemini liftoff. In our status of the uh, worldwide tracking network, we have one minor problem with the radar system at Bermuda. However, they can support the mission. Meanwhile, out at Canton Island, the uh, high-frequency transmitter apparently is not repairable in the near future. They have an estimated time of repair of 
22 November. However, this is not a mandatory item for the mission and will cause no problems. The Agena target vehicle at the present time is over the south central portion of the continent of Africa and will come over the Carnarvon, Australia tracking station in approximately uh, 19 minutes. We will switch now to launch control at the Cape. This is Gemini Launch Control at the Cape, 62 minutes and counting. All systems still looking good. We've just gone through a status check at the blockhouse to determine how we stand as far as lowering the rector is concerned. And all of the crew of members in the blockhouse reported that they were ready for it. It's due about five minutes from this time. Astronauts Jim Lovell and Buzz Aldrin have been uh, notified to expect uh, the 138-foot director will be coming down shortly. Just prior to this event, uh, we have opened the pre-valve in the first stage of the Gemini launch vehicle. This permits uh, the oxidizer or some oxidizer to flow into a standpipe in the first stage system. The purpose of the standpipe to help suppress possible vibrations that we could get in flight. This is the so-called pogo effect and uh, this particular test has already been completed. We're now at T-minus 61 minutes, 8 seconds and counting. This is Gemini Launch Control. We are now seven minutes away from the scheduled liftoff of the astronauts there atop the rocket, pad 19 at Cape Kennedy. We're just minutes away from the last last off in the Gemini series. This is the end of Gemini 12. About six and a half minutes away now from the scheduled liftoff from pad 19. You're listening to NBC Radio's coverage of the flight of Gemini 12. This is Robert Goralski with Wilson Hall and Jay Barbary at the NBC News Space Center reporting on the flight of Gemini 12. We now have begun the hold. We are three minutes to schedule blast off by the clock, but because of the hold, we're perhaps about six minutes away. This was an anticipated hold. It had been scheduled. It is built in. There's nothing unusual about this hold. It was scheduled to begin at T minus three, and it did that just about 30 seconds ago. It held. They, during this period, they will be checking on all the various technical problems that might arise in the few minutes before blastoff. Jay, the weather still uh, remains perfect at the Cape. It uh, is good in every way. That's true, Bob. The weather here is perfect today. In fact, it's the most perfect weather that we've ever seen, at least, for a man launch. As you mentioned, we are now in this hold, and the reason for the hold is so that the computers can uh, double-check the exact position of the Agena target in space to give uh, the launch crew here the exact moment of liftoff necessary for the Titan 12 rocket to roar into orbit to begin its uh, rendezvous pursuit of the target. And that today, if they're going to uh, catch the uh, Agena target rocket over the western Indian Ocean, they'll have to get off the ground here in a short span time of only 33 seconds. Otherwise, uh, they could take an additional two minutes to leave uh, the pad here with the Gemini 12 spacecraft, but then they would have to catch the uh, target in four orbits around the Earth. Well, as we've been mentioning repeatedly, this is the last flight in the Gemini series, and it all began many, many dollars ago. Wilson Hall? He has about $1,400,000,000 ago. This uh, four-day flight of Gemini 12 is the final flight in the Gemini series, the final rehearsal, so to speak, for the Apollo man flight, which will get an American astronaut on the moon, we hope, by late 1968. Of the 12 flights in the Gemini series, only the last nine were manned, that was starting back on March 23, 1965, when Gemini 3 astronauts Grissom and Young opened the series. Uh, when Gemini Project started, its goal was to prove techniques to be used in the Apollo man shoots, uh, moon shoots, rather. The um, prime objectives were rendezvous and docking and long duration flights. And these have been all achieved. Today's command pilot, as we said before, Lovell is a veteran of a uh, record 14-day voyage on Gemini 7. Uh, last December. Well, at the beginning of the Gemini series, extravehicular activity, spacewalks, were far down the list of goals and objectives, but however, once the spacewalking started, it's become a big question mark. Particularly, how long can a man work in space? How much work can he do without becoming just plain pooped, exhausted? 
Well, the last two spacewalks had to be ended before their scheduled time when the astronauts became exhausted doing minor jobs. So one of the key objectives in this, the last of the Gemini missions, is to learn more about man's ability to work on his own outside the spacecraft. Astronaut Edwin Buzz Aldrin will be the man who does the excursions in space during this mission. So space officials are looking for these two main things during the spacewalks. Uh, if frequent rest periods will make it easier to do the job, and if Aldrin's chest-packed life support system uh, can um, play a large part in making the job uh, easier. Well, we're now uh, still in the hold period, uh, T-3 and holding. This was a built-in hold. We'll repeat. Uh, nothing unusual is happening. They're going through the last-minute checks. Let's switch now to uh, Jay Barbary again. We're just at this moment ready to pick up the uh, countdown here at Cape Kennedy. We're now two minutes and 50 seconds and counting, Robert. And all is ready here on launch pad 19 as astronauts James Lovell and Edwin Aldrin wait inside their spacecraft on top of the 11-story Titan II rocket. Uh, the uh, Gina target is now over the Gulf of Mexico. It's moving through space at five miles per second. And when it moves over the state of Florida, the Titan II rocket will be triggered to begin the last rendezvous flight in this Gemini program. The countdown now is two minutes and 23 seconds and still counting. Thousands of workers here at the spaceport are out to watch the Gemini 12 launched into space on a trip which will take the astronauts to a height of 460 miles above the United States. Man has been higher than this. In fact, on the last flight, the Gemini 11 astronauts went to a record altitude of 800 and something miles, but at an altitude, that altitude on the other side of the Earth. They hope to go to 460 miles over this country and give us a picture from space of the country laid out like a map on the ground beneath them. The weather here this afternoon is just perfect. It couldn't be better. Uh, there's not any clouds in the sky to mention, mention of, and uh, there are no, absolutely no wind whatsoever. At the moment, the astronauts are on their backs in the Gemini 12. They're looking up at this blue sky over the Atlantic. The surf is rolling in from the ocean a short distance from the launch pad, while rescue helicopters uh, circle over the Atlantic, and there are land vehicles here and recovery ships standing by just in case that they are needed. We are now at 1 minute and 20 seconds before liftoff, and the Agena target is approaching the spaceport, and we are approaching that moment of liftoff with just one minute to go, so we'll switch to Jack King and Gemini Launch Control for the final countdown. And counting. Another key test uh, during the final phases that was just completed was a test, a final test of those engines and the guidance system in which we actually give, gimbal those engines a final test of swinging them to ensure they respond to the guidance system. Uh, coming up on 50 seconds, Mark, T-minus 50 seconds and counting. The crew in the blockhouse now monitoring their consoles during these final phases. All reports come back good at T-minus 40 seconds and counting. T minus 35, the pre valves now have been opened to permit the propellants to come down toward the chamber. There's only one valve left which will open at zero. T minus 25 seconds and counting. T minus 20. T minus 15 seconds and counting. It's quiet in the blockhouse as we continue to monitor at 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have ignit. The big Titan II rocket has been triggered, and astronauts James Lovell and Edwin Aldrin are on their way into space to conclude the Gemini project in the next four days. The liftoff was clean and beautiful as the silver rocket climbs into the Florida sky. Command pilot level, the space flight champion, in time spent in orbit, is scanning the Gemini 12 instrument and reporting their readings to the Mission Control Center in Houston. As you can hear, the rocket's roar is at its peak as the sound is swept across our NBC News Center by a breeze from the Atlantic Ocean. We might add that our microphone is not capable of picking up the fullness of this rocket's teeth-shattering roar, but we'll listen for a moment.
Titan II rocket's two big motors are spouting 430,000 pounds of thrust to push astronauts Lovell and Aldrin toward their rendezvous with the Agena target. If orbit successfully, the astronauts hope to catch the Agena three orbits from now over the southern, uh, over the southern Atlantic Ocean approaching the western, uh, eastern coast of Africa. The Gemini 12 rocket is beginning to tilt over in, in its flight path over the ocean. It appears to be rising on a transparent column of heat. The rocket that uses fuel which does not burn bright flame. Uh, instead of the usual fire we're generally used to watching here, we are now losing sight of it. But in Houston, Texas, at the Mission Control Center, Terry White is there. He has all the maps and charts necessary to watch these men go into orbit. We switch now for his continuous commentary. Mark, one plus 40. We are now receiving the live voices of the astronauts from the Gemini 12 spacecraft. Roger. Flight Dynamics says all data looks good on the Gemini 12 launch. Mission Control is go for staging. Roger, you're go for staging on the ground. Staging will occur at 2 plus 36. DCS updated. Roger, DCS. You are listening to transmissions from the spacecraft. Initial steering on the uh, second stage of the Gemini launch vehicle looks good. That perfect staging. This is the voice of Terry right. White from the Mission Control Center in Houston. We were watching the staging of the rockets uh, via a telescope camera here, and it was fantastic. Everything is Flight still on schedule. Right down the middle. Uh, yes, uh, out, huh? Roger, copy. You're steering right down the pipe. Man, this is a pretty good visual simulation. How do you like that? You are listening to the voices of the astronauts as James Lovell and Edwin Aldrin ride their Titan II rocket into orbit. Three miles downrange at an altitude of 70.4 nautical miles. Flight Director Glenn Lenny is pulling the various positions here in the Mission Control Center. Everybody says go. That's the best word that we could be receiving at this time. Roger, your go here on the ground. Plots in the tra trajectory plot boards on the front of mission control here are following almost on the money, even better than simulations. The report coming to you from the mission control center in Houston. Coming up on uh, point eight, that is when eighty percent of the required velocity for insertion. That is NASA spokesman Terry White. And we are also picking up the live transmissions of the Gemini astronauts. Mark point, point 8. Point 8 means 80% of the speed necessary to orbit the Earth. Coming up on second stage engine cutoff. That should occur at this moment. Roger, 
Rico. Roger, 12, you're go for Ivar. Was capsule communicator telling Jiminy 12 it's go for Ivar, which simply means a correction of velocity necessary to set him up for the rendezvous course. Roger. Command pilot Lovell will use his onboard rocket power to adjust his speed now in his position in order to begin the rendezvous for catching the uh, satellite in three revolutions of Earth. Houston, copy. Now appears that all is well for the beginning of the 12th Gemini flight, the 10th man one in the program, and the 16th man flight for this country. We're now at 6 minutes 44 seconds after liftoff. Roger, understand 24 forward, 8 left, is that correct? 28 forward, Roger, copy. These are the computer figures being read out by astronaut James Lovell to the Mission Control Center telling them the amount of burn that he needs on his onboard rocket power to adjust his speed the for the rendezvous. The 28 feet per second forward refers to the so-called IVAR, or insertion velocity adjustment routine, wherein the crew of the spacecraft will tune up the orbit after a second stage engine cutoff to take out any small underspeed quantities in the uh, launch vehicle. IVAR is another one of the many acronyms in the space business. However, uh, these acronyms are quite accurate and uh, m make for a very concise conversation on the air-to-ground loops and in other conversations here in the control center. We're now at 7 minutes, 53 seconds after liftoff. We'll be keeping our line open to Houston to pick up reports from the Manned Spacecraft Center. And, of course, we're able to pick up live the voices of the astronauts F as they report back to Houston. We're now eight and a half minutes Hello, into the flight of Gemini 12. Oh, one problem. The voices of the astronauts, Robert, uh, are being relayed via the Bermuda tracking station at this moment through Cape Kennedy here to the Mission Control Center in Houston. They have performed this IVAR, IVAR burn, to make the proper correction uh, as the first maneuver required to line up for the rendezvous with the Agena target a little more than three hours from now. Apparently everything is right on the money as they explain from the Mission Control Center in Houston. And Gemini 12 is in orbit. When they went off on schedule, the Atlas of Gino was launched an hour and 47 minutes ago, right on the button. And then the Titan II with the astronauts aboard went off on schedule nine and a half minutes ago. Gemini 12 looks extremely successful. Not much conversation point. between Gemini 12 and the ground at the present time. We're waiting for initial measurements of the Gemini 12's orbit. All the data incoming to Mission Control looks very good. This is Mission Control Houston at 9 minutes 48 seconds after liftoff. Well, that's the story. A successful liftoff of astronauts Lovell and Buzz Aldrin. They are in space. Now Aldrin has spent more time in space than any man alive. Lovell. Lovell, I'm sorry. Lovell. Lovell was the number two man on the Gemini 7 flight, and they were up for 14 days. And uh, his captain at that time were joint record holders. But now Lovell has gone up and he has established a new record. Uh, Wilson, I think we become very blasé about these space flights at this time. But uh, when you've got two men going up into space like that, when you get the countdown, 
10, 9, 8, right down the wire. It's, it's exciting all over again, isn't it? We shouldn't be blasé. No, we've, uh, although we've, these are the 25th and the 26th astronauts who uh, have gone into space. As you say, we, uh, because there have been 25 and now 26 men up there, we seem to forget that uh, sometimes, until they really go start off, that uh, this is an exciting thing for two men. The Soviet Union, by the way, has sent ten men and one woman into orbit. The Soviets haven't sent anybody up since March of 1965. Of course, uh, we've uh, had all our Germany flights since then. And they've, uh, the Soviets have been very silent about their future plans, although they said a few things in their conferences in, um, in Spain a few weeks ago, but didn't say anything specific, as they do not until they haven't. It's rather interesting. The U.S. government announced in the uh, last uh, few days that uh, for the second time in six weeks, we have indications that a Soviet uh, rocket that was blasted off from the Cosmoport blew up shortly after liftoff. And um, how we get this information, no one knows, but obviously we're monitoring uh, the information that uh, is available from the Soviet Union. It has Aubrey? something to do with uh, radars in a country known as Turkey, looking at a place called Bakanur and Kapustin Yar. <laughs> Say that again, Jay. <laughs> it's a place called Bakanur, which is Cosmonaut City. And uh, the launch site is at uh, Tiror Tom, which is on the Oral Sea in uh, Russia. Well, Jay, we're going to have to um, sign off here now. But a uh, reminder to our listeners that NBC News will provide continuing coverage, comprehensive coverage of the flight of Gemini 12. Robert Gorelsky with Wilson Hall and Jay Barbary at the NBC News Space Center. This is the NBC Radio Network. Houston, uh, that's beautiful. This has got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you.